finally. You don't know how excited I am about today's topic. I mean, I wanted to do a video on this like way back at CES, but I really didn't have that much information and I did not want to come across as just some guy rambling with no context. Now I get to be a guy rambling with context. It's a much nicer position to be in. And also, side rant, but the past several weeks have been great for the PC hardware, tuner, tweaker group. Lots of new GPUs and CPUs to endlessly benchmark. But what about us? The ones who can't afford the RTX, give me all your money, or whatever Nvidia calls them nowadays. What do we get? Well, we get something else to be excited about. That's what. Now, before we start the proverbial drooling over pre-release hardware, I have some housekeeping to attend to. For the unaware, I'm a co-host with fellow YouTuber Silicon Steak on the SFAB podcast. It's a computer hardware focused show with a heavy emphasis on actual discussion and conversation. Now I'm a huge podcast listener, but sometimes I can get sucked out of it when it feels like the people aren't really having a genuine conversation and it's more of a full blown TV production. Personally, in my biased opinion, I think it's pretty good and that you guys should all go and watch it. Silicon Steak is a great friend of the channel, essentially my tech brother from another motherboard. So your support would mean the absolute world to the both of us. I'm optimistic that the channel can grow exponentially in the next few months, so definitely join us for the ride. All right, that's it. Housekeeping done. Back to other exciting news. Today saw One X Player drop more information on their next major product, the One X Sugar, a dual screen foldable Android based handheld running on Qualcomm Snapdragon G3 Gen 3. That's already a wild combo, but it does not stop there. This thing has a detachable second screen, which raises about, you know, a million engineering and software questions. And the first one is, is this actually a One X Player design? And to answer that, no, this is not a design from them. The One X Sugar is being made in close collaboration with Sugar Cubes, a much smaller company that has been involved in creating some pretty innovative gaming accessories and devices. Sugar Cubes first gained attention with their metal controller case for the Microsoft Duo, or excuse me, Microsoft Surface Duo, and more recently, another collab between them and small universes on an emulation handheld. And you can guess what the standout feature was. That's right, a rotating screen. And this company seems to do a lot of this stuff, but at a much smaller scale. You can find the devices all throughout Chinese social media circles, but the One X Sugar is the West's first bit of exposure to them. The move seems strange on the part of One X Player, taking on such a risky design from a tiny company, but you know, I'll get into that later. What I really want to talk about right now is the performance. The device is confirmed to be using the Snapdragon G3 Gen 3, which is a step up from their previous gaming focused chips. This thing packs an eight core cryo CPU, split between one prime core, five performance cores, and two efficiency cores. So it's a mixed bag in terms of where the power will actually go. The Adreno 832 GPU is also in play here boasting hardware accelerated ray tracing and support for UE5's Lumen and Global Illumination. Sounds impressive, right? But let's be real here. This is not gonna compete with x86 devices. If you were hoping that this would somehow rival a 7840U or even a Steam Deck, let's just put that idea to rest right now. Although emulation wise, this is gonna run everything the Android platform has to offer. Everything from Big N up to PS3, Dreamcast, the entire retro and decently modern catalog is at your fingertips. But that's the nature of Android emulation. We're bound by the limits of immature software, not hardware, honestly. Emulation on Android has always been a finicky mess, and it's not helped by Qualcomm and their abysmal driver support. Okay, I was really trying to keep this video on track, but now it's soapbox time. I'd hazard a guess and say a decent majority of my audience are probably PC gamers, or at the very least, you guys are on console. So you know, for us, the GPU vendors will push out drivers for stability, performance increases, or new features on their platforms. That is nothing new and has been a thing since time immemorial. Well, for some reason, Qualcomm thinks that all they have to do is ship out one basic driver package for a platform, pray nothing breaks, and then act like they never supported that chip ever. Like it doesn't exist, it's done. It's one and done, no more. This is what they do. They do not provide direct driver updates to consumers like PC vendors do. 
they instead rely on the manufacturers to distribute drivers. So you need to wait for OnePlus, Samsung, Huawei to push your drivers. Could you imagine that? You bought an ASUS 3060 and you noticed that Gigabyte and PNY got game ready drivers last month, but you haven't gotten these since launch. Yeah, people would be riding in the streets. In fact, they do this with their X Elite laptops. You know, go talk to Silicon Stake. He'll tell you all about how much I complain about this. I had a Lenovo Snapdragon a little while back and I was gonna, you know, do a review on it. Well, one of the programs I was using didn't work. So I'm going around looking for a GPU driver update. Now, all the other vendors got the update, but for some reason, Lenovo was months behind and you can't use the same driver between vendors. That's insane. It's the same update, same code, but you can't apply it to your Snapdragon based product because the company you bought it from doesn't want to play ball or they're slow on the uptake. You know, that sounds wonderful, right? It's a great experience. And I'm not done yet. So Qualcomm also only supplies updates for about six months from a device's launch. And they're not, you know, just for performance, only for security and stability, not new features. I think you get the picture, but this is only the tip of the iceberg with the support of chips. The sad part is that they have some of the most capable mobile SOCs ever. Qualcomm mobile chips are pretty spectacular in their own right, but they get no love from Qualcomm after they've been kicked out of the fabs. I've always believed this and I still do. Android as a legitimate gaming platform could work. The hardware is there, but developers can't seriously support it if Qualcomm does it. They want to push the G3 line as the best in mobile gaming. Okay, well act like you have a gaming division at your company. Start courting developers, get big names on board, keep updating chips that have just released. Don't just parade one X player, Aya Neo and Retroid around, but not also get game devs on board. I mean, who's going to implement ray tracing into their UE5 mobile game if there's no vendor to go to when things get buggy? When I have an issue, I go to Nvidia or AMD. Is Qualcomm gonna help me out? Okay, all right, I'm done. Soapbox over. I got it out of my system. And at any rate, I'm not concerned about performance. I do want to objectively measure some of Qualcomm's more grander claims, especially all the Unreal Engine 5 stuff. I guess I'll need to build some sort of benchmark for it. Oh man, there goes all my extra free time and sleep. But who needs sleep when you've got two screens? Wait, one, two, three, four, two screens. Ooh, yeah. Let's talk about the marquee feature on this thing because I feel that people are missing some huge elephants in the room. Now, Android with dual screens. We've seen this before and history tells us that this is a software nightmare waiting to happen. The problem is that Android, despite all its multitasking improvements over the years, still is not built for dual screen gaming natively. Sure, Samsung and Microsoft have done some work with foldables like the Galaxy Z Fold and the Surface Duo, but the app support is still hit or miss itself. Now, I can tell you that DS, 3DS, and yes, even Wii U emulation will work just fine. So if that's your main worry, then feel free to cross it off the list. I'm more concerned about the general usability of the OS. How stable is Android going to be when you've got two screens to multitask with? I personally own a Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 5, and that device is fantastic works perfectly for me, and I rarely deal with misbehaving apps. But there's a huge difference with my phone and this sugar handheld. Difference being is you can't use both screens at once. The phone has two screens, one large inner one that can split screen and a smaller rear one for single-handed use. The One UI software doesn't have to worry about dragging apps across different sized windows or an app opening up on the wrong screen and freaking out. So how is this being dealt with in software for the sugar cube? My guess is that at a software level, the OS could think that, well, both screens are actually one, like my fold here. Wait, no, that doesn't make sense because then the aspect ratio would always be off on one side. In pre-release vids, you can see people playing 3DS games and drawing. So there is more going on, but no one ever shows the Android home screen 
which makes me believe that it's got to be something custom. Well, that and this Nitrex video saying just about as much. The software needs to be polished, more so than a Windows handheld, I'd argue. A lot of device quirks can be obfuscated behind Microsoft and their handling of the OS. But, you know, for this device, it's not some generic candy bar. This is an extremely exotic form factor, so the software solution needs to match. If one X player ships this out with a buggy OS experience, then you, you can expect the handheld equivalent of the French Revolution. Except instead of aristocrats, it's players' confidence in one X player getting the guillotine. And the durability of people's confidence in these companies is not as strong as these OEMs think. Oh, what a perfect segue. Yeah, durability. We've got some engineering madness going on here. Now I want to go on record saying I've actually held this handheld before at CES. I didn't get to turn it on, but I quite literally got my hands on it. It was quite the experience because it doesn't feel like anything you've really held before. At least to me it didn't. Ergonomic wise, the closest comparison I can give is like a Fisher Price toy, but not in the sense that the plastic is low quality. No, more like it's extremely light and very rounded. When you flip the screens back and you mess with the controllers, that feeling is so sublime. If you have a Nintendo Switch, then you know exactly what I mean. That clicking of the Joy-Cons is as much a feature as it is some sort of giddy fidget exercise. It's the same thing with the One X Sugar, but on steroids. The controller hinges at the time felt just right to me. There's this tightness at first, but once you're past like four degrees, it slides smoothly into place. I can already see people just flipping the screen up and down, turning the controls around, and I think the hardware team knows this. They did a little wink and nod in the marketing reveal, but the question is how long those hinges will last. We really should be having this discussion and not just accepting whatever because the design looks nice. We've seen it before. Hinges are the Achilles heel of any foldable device. You have moving parts, tiny mechanisms, and stress points that wear down over time. And here's what worries me. If the hinge is too stiff, it puts extra pressure on the casing and could lead to cracks. If it's too loose, the screens won't stay in place and might wobble while playing. If One X player went with plastic internals instead of reinforced metal, good luck keeping this thing alive after a year of heavy use. I really, really hope they've stress tested the heck out of this thing because nothing kills a cool handheld faster than a hinge that fails in under a year. Foldables and dual screen devices live or die by their build quality. And if they cheap out on this part, the entire project will collapse, well, literally. I'm gonna ask one player if I can get like a unit or at least a dummy unit at the very least so I can take a look at the hinge internals. They're probably gonna say no because I'm a plebeian in this YouTube niche, but I'm gonna ask anyways. It's as they say, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And speaking of getting, should you get this? Well, let's talk viability. Who is this thing for? This is a very deliberate, very bespoke machine. It's not trying to compete with the Steam Deck or the ROG Ally. It's doing its own thing and catering to a niche audience that wants a premium Android gaming experience, a dual screen device for emulation or multitasking, and something ultra portable, but different from the Deck and Legion Go crowd. But here's the real question. Is that enough to justify the price? We don't have an official word on price yet, but let's make some educated guesses. The Snapdragon G3 Gen 3 is not going to be cheap. It literally was just announced yesterday on the 17th. And you have to think about the detachable second screen, which adds complexity in software and engineering that we as consumers have to pay for. R&D ain't cheap. Now, I could be wrong, and there could be some sort of backroom deal worked out where Qualcomm is subsidizing the cost as handheld to push their new line of chips. But come on, give me a break. They didn't even subsidize the launch of the X Elite chips for Windows on ARM, and that was supposed to be a huge paradigm shift in client computing. They sent out a platform with comparable performance to AMD's Ryzen 8000 series and tried to charge MacBook Pro prices. So no, I don't expect 1X to get any free monies here. 
most One X Player handhelds usually launch in the, you know, thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range, depending on features and specs. If this thing lands at seven hundred to eight hundred bucks, I'd say that maybe has a shot, and that's a big maybe. That's a ton for a handheld that only plays Android games and emulates, you know, consoles. The Odin 2 Portal Max has a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 processor, comes with 16 gigs of LPDDR5X and one terabyte of storage. This costs 529 at retail. Now, yeah, it's, you know, an older chipset from Qualcomm, but it still smokes through emulation in Android games. You can even play some PC games using Winulator, so this platform is no slouch. If AYN brought this to market at 500 bucks, what do you think 1X will have to charge? You know, I've always found their product prices to be steep, but relatively fair for what you get. They don't have a practice of gouging. So I just say all that to say, keep the context in mind. If they can hit a $500 price point that's not gimped on storage or memory, then I'll be very impressed. Like LPDDR5X can be used in denominations of four without an issue. If 16 gigs is too much, then at least have the base model ship with 12. That's fair in my opinion, right? That's, that's fair. Oh, and if retail has to be expensive, then the Indiegogo campaign discount should really be enticing, like 30% or higher. Early adopters need a plaque for making a gamble like this. And just for historical reference, Microsoft could not sell the Surface Duo 2 at 1500 bucks, and that was a fully fledged phone with Microsoft engineering behind it. If 1X player expects people to drop x86 handheld money on a device that still has to fight against Android's jank, that's a tough sell, I'm sorry. Price is gonna be make or break more so than any other handheld, and this, you know guys, is just the one to watch. Just as I'm the one to watch for more 1X sugar news and other related tech shenanigans. I'm the Silicon Fox, signing out and saying, don't eat your candy before bed.